Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on the signs and symptoms of reheated rice syndrome. If you want more information on reheated rice syndrome, please check out my full lesson on this topic. So we're going to discuss the signs and symptoms of this condition. But before we talk about those signs and symptoms, let's talk about what this condition is. So reheated rice syndrome is a food poisoning condition caused by infection with a bacteria known as Bacillus cereus. Now Bacillus cereus is going to be a gram positive rod. If we look in this image here, this is an actual photo of Bacillus cereus and you can see that they are purple in coloration. So they've been gram stained and when they're purple, they are gram positive and they are rod shaped. They're also what we would call facultatively anaerobic, meaning that they prefer to live in places that do have oxygen, but they can, if they have to, live in environments that don't have oxygen. And what's important with regards to signs and symptoms is that they are toxin producing and spore forming bacteria. So these spores of this particular bacteria can be found in rice and some other foods. It can be in rice and when we reheat that rice, some of these spores produce toxins that are resistant to heating. So you can't destroy those toxins. This is going to be a relatively rare condition considering how many individuals eat rice, but this is a condition that can occur. So because of the prevalence of eating rice around the world, this condition can occur globally. We don't have many numbers for individuals who get infected around the world, but it has been estimated that at least 60,000 people in the United States can get infected with reheated rice syndrome per year. So again, it sounds like a large number, but it's relatively small compared to how many eat rice and how regularly they eat it. Before we talk about the signs and symptoms, we have to discuss certain types of infections that we can get from this particular bacteria bacillus cereus. So one is what we call the emetic type. Emetic refers to vomiting. So that's going to describe what happens with this particular type. And then the other one is diarrheal type. And that also tells us what happens with that type. So each type is going to occur with a different pathophysiology. In emetic type, the upper gastrointestinal or GI tract is affected. We have to look at this diagram here to know what the upper GI tract is. So if we look at this image here, here's the esophagus that goes into the stomach. The stomach goes into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, which wraps around inside the abdomen until it reaches the large intestine, which then finishes at the rectum and anus. Now, the upper GI tract is anything that is proximal or above what we call the ligament of trites. The ligament of trites is located in and around the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. So the emetic type is going to occur in the upper GI tract. So it's going to occur mostly in the stomach and perhaps the first part of the small intestine. This particular type is going to occur more rapidly than the diarrheal type with symptom onset in 30 minutes to six hours. The reason that this type can occur more quickly is because it is due to a preformed toxin known as cerealide. So cerealide is produced by spores of this particular bacteria. Those toxins are inside food like rice. When we consume it, we can become ill quite quickly within 30 minutes. Now in the diarrheal type, it's the lower GI tract that's going to be affected. So anything below or distal to the ligament of trites. So anything in some of the later parts of the small intestine and the large intestine. Now, the symptom onset in the diarrheal type is anywhere from 6 to 18 hours, and this is going to be due to ingestion of cells that produce and secrete multiple enterotoxins. So that's a difference with regards to emetic type. Emetic type, you're ingesting the toxin. In diarrheal type, you're ingesting cells that then produce toxins. So this is the reason why it can take a bit longer for us to see signs and symptoms. So as we ingest the cells, they survive the stomach. They can enter into some of the other parts of the gastrointestinal system. And then as they move around through the intestinal system, they can produce and secrete multiple enterotoxins leading to the diarrheal type. So these are the two main types of the reheated rice syndrome or the food poisoning caused by bacillus series infection. So the first type we're going to look at is the emetic type. So the emetic type, as mentioned before, it's going to be due to that preformed toxin, cerealide, and that's going to lead to issues in the upper gastrointestinal tract. So that's going to involve the stomach. That's why we're going to see nausea and vomiting. Now nausea and vomiting can be quite severe and it can have a sudden onset. It may actually be one of the first symptoms that is going to occur. And as mentioned before, it can occur within 30 minutes. And this is going to be due to 
serialite toxin causing irritation of the gastric mucosa. So the gastric mucosa is the internal lining of the stomach. So that toxin is irritating the internal lining of the stomach, leading to nausea and vomiting. Another possible symptom of the emetic type is abdominal pain. So abdominal pain, it may be diffuse, it may be more localized to the epigastric area or above the belly button, kind of in the center of the abdomen where the stomach would be located. It's going to be described as crampy in nature, and again, it can be due to a similar effect where that toxin is leading to irritation and inflammation. Now, some other possible signs and symptoms of the emetic type are going to include diarrhea, although diarrhea is going to be more uncommon in this particular type. It can occur in some cases, and if it does occur, it's going to be quite mild, and there may be a little bit of watery diarrhea that can occur. And the other important point here to make note of with regards to the emetic type is that there is a very, very, very small chance, a very rare chance that there may be hepatic failure or hepatic injury, so injury to the liver. This is going to be a very rare complication of the emetic type. This is because that serialide toxin inhibits proper mitochondrial functioning. It impacts the mitochondria in the cells, and hepatocytes, those liver cells, are going to be highly metabolically active. So they're going to involve a lot of metabolic activity. And this is the reason why they can be primarily affected by this particular toxin. So in some cases, again, very rare, some cases serialide may lead to a damage to mitochondrial functioning, leading to damage to hepatocytes. And we may see increased ALT and AST. These are what we call liver enzymes. We, we may see some other findings that may indicate liver failure in some, again, very rare cases. If patients do get hepatic failure, they're more likely to be very young, so young children, or those who are immunocompromised. So these are the signs and symptoms of the emetic type. Again, symptom onset occurs within 30 minutes to six hours. Once signs and symptoms have occurred, most often the signs and symptoms will resolve on their own within 24 hours, and thus we have some of these severe complications. And moving on to the diarrheal type, with the diarrheal type, we're going to have diarrhea. So diarrhea is often going to be profuse or at least moderate in intensity. It's going to be watery diarrhea and it's going to be non-bloody. So that's going to be key with regards to bacillus series infections, watery, non-bloody diarrhea. We can also see abdominal pain occurring. So this is again going to be diffuse. It's more likely to be more generalized compared to the abdominal pain we may see in the emetic type and it's going to be cramping in nature as well, and it's going to be more prominent. The pain is going to be more severe. And again, these particular signs and symptoms of the diarrheal type will have an onset within 6 to 18 hours of consumption of the food. Another important point to make note of here is with the diarrheal type, this is less likely to occur with consumption of rice. Consumption of rice is more likely to lead to the emetic type. Consumption of other types of food that have been improperly handled, for instance, are more likely to lead to the diarrheal type, these include eating certain things like meats, vegetables, and different sauces. So again, eating rice is more likely to lead to the emetic type with that serialized toxin, whereas the diarrheal type is more likely to occur from consuming other types of foods. Other signs and symptoms of the diarrheal type can include fever as well. So a mild fever may be present. It's going to be generally rare in the emetic type, but it can occur in the diarrheal type due to the consumption of those cells that produce the enterotoxins, the cells themselves are going to lead to an immune reaction within the gastrointestinal system. So that can be very important as well. And then the fever itself is going to often be low-grade fever, anywhere from perhaps low 38, so 30 to 38.5 degrees Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit. And again, as with the emetic type, the diarrheal type, the signs and symptoms will resolve within 24 hours of onset. Now, moving on to extraintestinal manifestations of a bacillus series infection. So this is not going to occur from eating rice or other contaminated foods. It will occur by other mechanisms. We'll describe those here when we talk about the particular signs and symptoms. One of them is known as endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis is going to be the most common extraintestinal manifestation. This is where there's essentially pus within the eye. It can lead to vision loss, and it's going to be due to in ocular penetration injuries. So we get bacillus series bacteria on something and then that particular thing gets penetrated into the eye that can introduce bacillus series into the eye leading to this particular manifestation. Some individuals have also been exposed to bacillus series by 
inhalation leading to a respiratory illness. So if we were to inhale certain types of Bacillus cereus bacteria, this can lead to anthrax-like respiratory illness. This is very rare. It's been only described in a handful of cases. Again, it occurs in certain strains of Bacillus cereus, more specifically Bacillus cereus biovar anthracus. This particular strain has similar toxins to Bacillus anthracus, the bacteria that causes anthrax. So in individuals who are exposed to this particular strain of Bacillus cereus via inhalation, they can have fever and chills, dyspnea or shortness of breath, hemorrhagic mediastinitis, so there's bleeding within the chest wall, and rapid respiratory failure. This again is very, very rare, and it has only been noted a few cases in metal workers. Now, another possible extraintestinal manifestation of Bacillus cereus infection is what we call endocarditis. Endocarditis is an infection and inflammation of the endocardium. The endocardium is the inner lining of the heart. This is more likely to occur in IV drug users and central venous catheter patients. And what we can see is that we can have fever and chills. We may have a new heart murmur. So if we were to use our stethoscope and listen to the heart, there may be new heart murmur or a changing murmur that was previously there. And there may be stroke and infarcts, depending on which side of the heart has particular vegetations. Patients can have some other signs and symptoms of infective endocarditis, like Osler nodes, Janeway lesions, and the Roth spots. And then another possible extraintestinal manifestation of Bacillus cereus infections can simply be bacteremia and septicemia. So bacteremia is where we are to check the blood of a patient. They actually have Bacillus cereus in the blood. So this is often going to occur in severely ill patients, maybe due to a previous endocarditis that the patient may have had. So they might have had Bacillus cereus endocarditis that leads to bacteremia and septicemia. And it's often going to occur in immunocompromised patients. Now, septicemia can lead to fever and chills, hypotension or low blood pressure, tachycardia, high heart rate, so a heart rate above 100 beats per minute, and altered mental status, among some other findings as well. Again, if you want more information on bacillus serious infections, please check my full lesson on this topic. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one, and please consider joining as a member to access members-only content. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.